The Tom Woods Show, episode 788. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if you're at your wit's end trying to think of a good gift idea for your brother, your father, or any significant man in your life, well, check out the limited edition holiday shave set from Harry's. Take $5 off at harrys.com when you use coupon code WOODS. Hey, everybody, Tom Woods here. Our old friend Eric Peters is back here on the show. Eric, of course, runs ericpetersautos.com. You can also reach it at epautos.com. It is the great melding together of automobile news and libertarianism. It's fantastic. I'm not even a car guy, and I love it. I donate to the site. He's doing great and important work. He's so knowledgeable, and he's always fun to talk to, and there's always some great news. We just wait three, four weeks between episodes. There's always something interesting going on that he's commenting about, and I'm glad to have him here to do that once again. Eric, welcome back to the show. Hi, Tom. Good to be here. Lots to talk about, as always, because I guess it's always like six weeks, six to eight weeks in between appearances by you and a lot of stories accumulate. Now, the, a lot of cars are coming out for the 2017 model year, so certainly we'll want to say something about that. But there's a somewhat breaking story. It was last week, as people are hearing this, but it involves Volkswagen and some jobs that they just decided to shed. Yep. And you, you wrote More a piece. Just some. Yeah, you wrote a piece called What It Costs Us. So tell us about it. Yeah. Well, uh, the announcement came on Friday that Volkswagen um, will be shedding 30,000 jobs, um, which is just a staggering figure. And the reason that they're having to do this, of course, is because of the costs incurred by this uh, cheating fiasco. Um, their profits are way down. They've lost their status, Volkswagen Group, as the world's largest automaker. And the fallout is continuing. They're looking at billions of dollars, ultimately, um, in losses as a result of this thing. And, you know, this is a tangible harm to real people. You know, you're talking about 30,000 people now um, who are going to lose their livelihood over uh, a scandal that, as far as I can tell and as far as anybody else has been able to determine, hasn't caused tangible harm to a single human being, an actual person. Yeah, that was the point that you've made on the show probably more than once. Yep. And so this is a huge, huge number of jobs. So what is this – does this say something about the – I mean, you could just because you shed some jobs doesn't necessarily mean that you're going down the toilet, but it's not always a good sign. No, well, this is if you dig into the numbers, um, they are looking ultimately at uh, costs in the range of thirty to forty billion dollars. Now, Volkswagen is a very large corporation. Volkswagen includes Audi and Porsche, uh, and you know they have a lot of revenue, but that's crippling even to a major car company. Uh, it, it will it will manifest in the form of such things as reduced uh, funds available for research and development into new models. So you're going to see a ripple effect of this as the years roll by. They're not going to be able to update a lot of their cars and remain competitive in the marketplace. Um, and here in the United States, you know, dealers have been just really, really badly hurt by this. They had uh, inventories of 2016 model cars that had the TDI diesel engine that they were forbidden by the EPA from selling. And so those cars just sat there, and that means that salesmen didn't earn commissions, the dealer didn't earn money. Uh, they had, of course, spent a lot of money to get these cars to sell them. With you know, That was the purpose of getting them to sell them, and now they can't sell them. And you know, the, the, the fallout has spread to the gasoline-powered cars. VW is heavily discounting all their vehicles because the public has been led to believe that Volkswagens are bad cars, which is absolutely not the case. Well, of course, right now we are on the cusp of a new presidential administration, and I'm yeah. curious to get your thoughts about what that might mean for the automobile industry. Well, I'm very cautiously optimistic. Minimally, we know uh, that we have a person here who does understand economics, who does understand uh, cost-benefit. That's very important. And I think at a more fundamental level, um, Trump does not have animosity toward either vehicles, uh, the car industry, or the idea of affordable mobility for the average person, whereas uh, the alternative, who thank God lost, <laughs> did. Um, he has already indicated uh, that he wants to sit down with the car companies to talk about the, the regulatory state, um, and hopefully with a view toward 
reasonable regulations. I think ultimately that's what we are talking about here. Um, nobody I th- can object to a reasonable uh, uh, coming together of the minds, but we're at this point now where the EPA has become zealous, fanatical, and entirely unreasonable. Um, and the parallel, I, I call them the EPA ayatollahs because that's what they are. They are religious fanatics. We are at the, long since past the point of diminishing returns uh, and reasonable regulations with this stuff. I want to talk to you about the – we've talked about electric cars before, but let's talk about the Chevy Bolt because I read your item on this about a couple of weeks ago yeah. and in which you say you had planned to review the new Chevy Bolt because you do a lot of car reviews on at, at uh, epautos.com yep. and you know, you, you know through by, by means of a test drive. But you report that GM has rescinded your privileges for reasons known only to them but strongly suspected by you. Before we get into the Chevy Bolt, first of all, what do you mean by rescinded your privileges? Are you, because you're in the media, entitled to to test drives on a regular basis? Well, I wouldn't say entitled. Um, I've been writing or, about cars. Or you have cars. a reasonable expectation of them, let's say. Well, I mean, I've been getting cars from all the major manufacturers for more than 20 years. Uh, you know, you, uh, you, your status as, a, as an automotive journalist reaches a certain point. You gain access to what are called the press fleets that all the car companies maintain, and they, they circulate the cars. Uh, among us journalists, we drive the cars, and, and then we write an evaluation of the car. Um, and I got in trouble with General Motors, I'm pretty sure, because uh, I'll tell you about the, the coincidence. Um, I have to give you the background first. I've been getting cars regularly from General Motors since the mid-1990s without interruption. Okay. Well, uh, in early October, I wrote a piece about General Motors retiring vice president of diversity, if you can believe that they have such a thing. Um, they have an in-house Jesse Jackson, and I'm, I'm sure that other manufacturers also have one, uh, you know, who basically works to, uh, to, to establish these racial set-asides, uh, ostensibly in the name of fighting racism. You know, so I, I kind of wrote an article that was poking fun at all that. Well, a couple of weeks later, literally two weeks later, um, I made my normal fall request to uh, get into some GM vehicles. <laughs> I found out the plug had been pulled, and I just don't think that that's a coincidence. I think I offended some politically correct orthodoxy. Well, speaking of plug being pulled, it was the Chevy Bolt you were interested in talking about. So you're going to have to talk about the Chevy Bolt on the basis of what you can discover, you know, in, through avenues other than a test drive. So what did you find out about the Chevy Bolt? And by the way, let's make clear here, if we're t- I, ha- I can't keep track in my mind about the, the Bolt and the Volt. What's the difference here? Yes. Well, the Volt is technically a hybrid. It has an internal combustion engine, and it's basically like carrying around a Briggs & Stratton generator. The gas engine doesn't uh, propel the car per se. All it does is run to produce electricity like a generator to, to constantly feed electricity uh, to the batteries and the electric motors, whereas the Bolt is a pure electric car. It has no internal combustion engine. It's driven entirely um, by batteries and electric motors. All right, so now go ahead and tell us what you've been able to find out about it. Okay, well, the issue with the Bolt, you know, and people, some people uh, call me a, a hater of EVs, and that's not the case. Uh, I will uh, acknowledge that electric cars have some uh, attributes uh, that are desirable. But the problem is they also have other attributes that um, these people simply do not want to discuss that are very significant. Uh, And the chief of these problems is that the range, even under the best of circumstances, uh, is literally a fraction of that that you would get with any conventional internal combustion engine car, and that's a problem. And it's a problem that's compounded by uh, the lengthy recharge times. Um, I did a piece a few weeks prior to that um, about... Uh, Obama trying to push a massive program to erect what are called um, fast chargers or superchargers uh, around the country to try to address this problem. And these allow an electric car to be recharged um, more rapidly than would be the case um, if you plug the car in at a, in a standard household outlet, which can take eight hours overnight, a very long time. But it's still a long time. Even at the fast chargers, you're looking at about a 30 to 45 minute wait. Um, to get the batteries up to about 80% capacity, which is the most you can do without hurting the batteries. Uh, and so then you get back on the road and, you know, you have uh, 80% of the optimal best case range. So, you know, you're looking at about maybe 70 miles, let's say. And that's just not going to cut it for most people. That's a real hassle. We live in a fast-paced, fast-food culture. Can you imagine waiting for 30 to 45 minutes to recharge your vehicle so that you could go another 80 miles? Yeah, this is a complete non-starter. And then what's the sticker price for this thing? 
Yeah, and this is the Bolt is basically a subcompact economy car. It's a little thing. It's a commuter car. It's a city car, and it has a sticker price of thirty-five thousand dollars, which is you know in the business you would you would put that at the entry luxury price point, which means you could get into something like a, a Lexus ES three hundred and fifty, let's say, or an entry level BMW for that amount of money. An entry level BMW or a Chevy Bolt. <laughs> right for a little economy car, or and you know I think the more apt comparison that I made in the article was just to compare it to a an equivalent uh, IC engine car, um, which costs half as much. You know you can buy uh, offhand I'm, I'm having an Alzheimerian moment. I can't remember the model name, but GM sells an, uh, the Sonic uh, that, that starts around fifteen thousand dollars, so literally less than half the cost of the Bolt. And the Sonic can go 400 miles under any conditions. It's not affected by heat or cold. Electric car batteries are. Um, and it can be refueled in five minutes. So, you know, you tell me, is that a reasonable objection to make? I, the reason these cars don't sell, other than to a very small uh, group of people, is because they're simply not practical functionally, and they don't make sense economically. And you can wish all you want to for uh, a world full of zero emissions electric cars, but until those problems are dealt with, it's a non-starter. So people would buy this car mainly because they think I'm helping the environment by buying this. It's not because they are going to save money on gas, because if when you do the math, having a car that costs double, it's going to take you a long, long time to make that up in gas price differential, right? Yeah, hundreds of thousands of miles. All of all this is it's it's analogous to the guy who goes out and uh, you know dangles the keys to his brand new Porsche 911 to his friends, which is fine. Hey, look, I've got a Porsche, um, and and there's nothing wrong with dangling the keys to your electric car and saying, hey, look, I got an electric car. I don't have a problem with that. What I have a problem with is them being forced onto the market, onto our backs, yours and mine, via subsidies. Nobody is subsidizing Porsches. Uh, you know, I don't have to pay for my rich neighbor's 911. Why should I have to pay for my rich neighbor's Tesla? Well, I want to talk to you about – there's a, a guy, I guess, was he with the New York Times? Yes, Clarence Ditlow, who died oh, recently. Oh, gosh, yeah. And mm -hmm. I want to talk mm -hmm. about him because he kind of personified everything that's wrong with commentary about cars and safety. Let's first thank our sponsor. Folks, at this point, you're probably losing track of all the ways the Tom Woods Show improves your life. But here's another one. When it comes to gift giving, if you're like me, you don't want to give something that's useless and both you and your recipient know it. So how about something both practical and personal, the perfect gift for a brother, a father, a husband, or even a secret Santa recipient? It's Harry's Holiday Shave Kit. It comes in a beautifully designed gift box. It comes with a midnight blue chrome razor handle. You can get it engraved with up to three initials. It's got three of Harry's German-engineered five-blade cartridges. Gives you a very close, comfortable shave. It has converted me away from electric and back to blade. Plus a foaming shave gel that smells great. Just 30 smackers at harrys.com. I've partnered with Harry's to get you five smackers off your order when you enter code WOODS at checkout. Free shipping ends on December 9th, so act now. Go to harrys.com. Grab this beautiful holiday shave set and take five smackers off. That's harrys.com using coupon code WOODS. All right, I was saying before that break that this Clarence Ditlow from the New York Times recently died. He was described as the foremost advocate of automotive safety, which of course means we're going to send out the government goons and crack some skulls. That's what being an advocate means. So you can talk about him, but I, I want to focus in particular on the the key problem here, which is there are two contradictory orders being sent out by people like him. And the, the first is that we need to make cars safe. And to make them safe, they have to be heavier. But on the other hand, we need to make them fuel efficient, which means they have to be lighter. Right. Which means that car companies have to come up with these extremely convoluted Rube Goldberg solutions to somehow make these two requirements compatible with each other. Yeah, the, the two things are, are at odds with one, with one another. Um, realistically, again, economically, the only way to uh, make a given car uh, safer, uh, quote unquote, uh, is to increase the structure to make it um, bigger and heavier using steel primarily. Now, there are other materials that you can use to achieve the same effect like carbon fiber. Um, and uh, other exotic materials that are used in race cars, for example, but they're race cars, and race cars cost you know half a million dollars. 
so you have to think about, well, what's going to be economical? What's a way for us to uh, make the car pass the crashworthiness test demanded by the government and still keep it within a price point that is manageable? And the way to do that is to add structural steel to the vehicle. Structural steel, however, is heavy. And the heavier the car is, the bigger engine it needs to move and the more fuel that it uses. So now you've got this juxtaposition of the government demanding that cars be ever safer as defined by passing these crash tests and so on, um, and also get ever higher gas mileage. You can't have both. You can have one or the other or um, one of them to a lesser or more extreme, but you cannot have both in the same package. In particular, I like this sentence, even though I don't even know what half of it means, but I know, I know it must be a good sentence. You say that it's because of his advocacy for safety that cars have been made heavier, but because they must also be more fuel efficient, uh, again, by, by virtue of what the same people have demanded, the car industry has had to resort to over-the-top engineering solutions such as costly-slash-complex direct injection fuel delivery technology, variable displacement-slash-cylinder deactivation technology, multiple turbochargers bolted to tiny engines, 7, 8, 9, and soon 10-speed transmissions, active grill shutters, engine start-stop systems, and much more such to come. Well, in a way, you, you, you kind of have to tip your hat to the private sector to have come up with all this. Sure, I mean they're, they are engineering geniuses to have uh, figured out ways to, uh, to you know to, to to deal with all of these these regulatory fatwas, but they're not cheap. Um, you know there is a reason why the average price paid for a new car last year was in excess of thirty thousand uh, dollars, and there's a reason why the average person is now spending six or seven years to pay off a car. Uh, versus three or four years uh, as recently as 20 years ago. And it, a lot of it has to do with this stuff. Um, just to, to get into one of them, uh, the fuel injection. Uh, uh, back in the 80s, carburetors, which were a mechanical fuel delivery device, were replaced by a relatively simple form of fuel injection called throttle body fuel injection. Very simple, very cost effective, achieved tremendous gains both in economy and in reducing emissions because it could precisely meter the air fuel. Um, then they went to port fuel injection, which is more complicated. Now you have an individual injector at each cylinder spraying fuel. So for an eight-cylinder engine, you have eight injectors. And that was chiefly done because of the ever-tightening uh, emission standards and the need to, to get that much more mileage, but incrementally so, not a major uptick out of the engines. And now we're at direct injection, which involves spraying fuel at three or 4,000 pounds per square inch directly into the cylinder, um, and that requires uh, an elaborate multi-stage uh, fuel pump system uh, and creates uh, maintenance problems such as carbon buildup on the valves. And it's a big nightmare, and it's done chiefly because it provides a slight increase in mileage and a slight reduction in exhaust emissions. Now, what's going on with the big rig question? I know that Obama had some kind of order the, uh, I don't know if it's gone through. You'll have to give me the details. It's supposed to be in light of global warming, and so we're going to impose additional regulations on the kinds of trucks that many, many, many ordinary Americans drive. And I'm sorry to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but these also happen to be the exact people Obama hates. Sure. Um, this actually is a watershed moment. They are now trying to uh, categorize uh, carbon dioxide, which is essentially an inert gas. It doesn't at least have anything to do with air quality. It does not uh, affect smog. It has nothing to do with respiratory problems that people, people have. Um, they're trying to categorize that as an exhaust emission sub subject to regulation by the EPA. Uh, and they are going to attempt to impose um, greenhouse gas emission standards on heavy trucks. And this means not only uh, large pickups, 2,500 and 3,500 series trucks, but also over-the-road trucks, the, you know, the big rigs that bring us our food uh, and bring us all the stuff. Um, and it's going to impose tremendous costs on the trucking industry um, and thereby on us generally, on the economy. And it's another thing that hopefully Trump will, uh, will, will, will do something to, to rein in. Let's shift over now to the 2017 model year. Here we are talking in November, so it's one after the other now being rolled out, and you've had a chance to drive in some of them. And if you just go to epautos.com, you'll see right on the refurbished homepage, by the way, it looks absolutely beautiful. I love the new site. Terrific job. But you can see right off the bat as you scroll down through the items, it's one 2017 car after another. Now, of course, it's hard to compare one car to another because they're in different classes and they 
cost different and they have different functions. But all the same, you've got to have some kind of gut level favorites after having driven these 2017 cars. So what are your initial thoughts in, in the, among the first cars you've had a chance to drive? Well, actually, I think it would be interesting for us to just kind of juxtapose um, one of them, the 2017 Volkswagen Passat, uh, as against a um, another one, a hybrid, a Lexus NX300H, which I haven't yet written about, but I will shortly. I have it outside right now. Uh, the one being a hybrid, the other not. Now, the Passat, of course, has been shorn of its outstanding uh, 45 to almost 50 mile per gallon diesel engine. Um, however, uh, you can still buy a Passat um, for about $22,000 uh, that gets excellent gas mileage and that has more room um, than other mid-sized cars. It, in fact, has um, as much room in the back seat as many much larger full-size cars like the Chevy Impala, for example, and the Toyota Avalon for thousands of dollars less. Um, an Avalon stickers for about 32000 to start and the Impala stickers for about $27,000 to start. So you're looking at about a $5,000 price bump to get into those bigger cars, um, whereas the Volkswagen is very family-friendly, very family-affordable, $22,000. Now, compare that to the Lexus NX, which is the hybrid version of that vehicle, uh, and it is uh, $40,000 to start, and its mileage is not particularly that spectacular. It gets 31 on the highway, and the Volkswagen gets 34 with a gas engine. Um, so it's interesting to me, you know, you're going to spend uh, 40-something thousand dollars to get about the same mileage and I guess feel good about not being a, a, a planet raper, I suppose, I don't know, versus being able to drive in this outstanding Volkswagen sedan for about $22,000. So, all right, so you've been, you've been driving. So what are you just holding that wheel? Which one of these brand new ones do you say this is something that maybe might get overlooked or people might not know about, but they should know about? Well, let's see. Um, Nissan has also just come out with a new full-sized uh, version of their Titan pickup, which is excellent. And it's available uh, with a Cummins turbo diesel engine. Um, the other, uh, the big three, you can get a diesel, but you have to move up the food chain to get into their bigger trucks to get that. Um, it's a really nice truck, and I'm just hoping that uh, they and Chrysler, by the way, uh, are not ruined as a result of another diesel debacle, which I've written about. Um, apparently, uh, they are going after Cummins, which makes diesels and sells them to both Nissan and um, and to Chrysler. So that's another little bubbling up thing that could potentially cause problems for everybody. Well, incidentally, as I'm sitting here, I'm wondering if you have thought about any potential consequences from a Donald Trump presidency in terms of the automobile market. I mean, right? I mean, he's against so at least free trade as it has been practiced in some situations. Mm -hmm. He's not against all trade, but is there a chance that there could be some kind of attempt? I don't know how he'd get away with it in light of the different trade rules the U.S. has agreed to, but one way or another, you can evade those to, uh, to yeah. keep foreign vehicles out or make it more difficult to purchase them. Well, I think one thing that he could do, um, uh, and I think he, it's well within his prerogative to do this, uh, is to dial back some of the uh, the safety mandates that have made it uh, illegal uh, to import to this country some of the uh, simple and low-cost cars that are available in export markets. That's one thing. Uh, you can make an argument. Now, you know, we're libertarians, and, you know, we're all about not causing harm to people. You can make an argument about tailpipe exhaust emissions because, you know, at least in principle, this is something that can affect the commons, the public, right? But safety is a matter of our personal choice. If I choose to drive, uh, let's say, an old Volkswagen Beetle um, that's fairly flimsy by modern standards, and if I drive it into a tree, yeah, probably I'm going to get uh, hurt had I you know, been driving a Mercedes S-Class, let's say. But that's ultimately, that's my choice as a free person. Uh, if I choose to drive the simpler, less expensive car that may be theoretically less safe if I wreck it, I think the government has absolutely no business dictating safety uh, to the market and to individuals. Uh, I think it's risable. I think it's ridiculous, this, to get back to Clarence Ditlow, uh, to suggest that there isn't a market uh, motivation to, for some car companies to build so-called safe cars. Volvo built their entire business on that. So safety did sell. The problem is that, that guys like Ditlow and these other control freaks in the government want to impose that on everybody rather than leave people the options and give them the choice. If you want a safe car back in the 70s, you, know, you could buy a big Volvo 240 and have your very safe Volvo. If you wanted a car that was simpler and more economical, well, you could buy a little Datsun or, or a little Volkswagen Beetle. And I think we could return to those days. And I hope that Trump does do that. I think it's within his, his 
uh, his wheelhouse um, philosophically and intellectually, and I hope that he does that. I think it would be a boon to the economy uh, and for car buyers. Well, of course, as always, I want to urge people to check out your website because they're just going to love it. If you like cars and you're a libertarian, where else would you go other than epautos.com? There are a lot of stuff that's just straight reporting on cars, and there's some stuff that's straight libertarianism. But that glorious overlap is where you're really, really going to be in your element over at epautos.com. I actually donate to Eric every month because I like what he's doing, and I think it should be done, and I'm a total ignoramus when it comes to cars, but that doesn't mean that I can't spot somebody who's doing important work. So I I contribute to Eric, and I hope you'll join me over at epautos.com. Eric, thanks for your time today. Thank you, Tom. I always enjoy it. All right, everybody. Here's something you are definitely going to enjoy hearing, and you're going to be glad you know about it. It's another podcast. That's right. That's right. I'm promoting another podcast here on the show. It's the Anarchitecture Podcast at anarchitecturepodcast.com. Now, check it out. The idea behind it is this. We all know who would build the roads. But what about everything else? How about the water mains, the power grid, the airports, the sewers, the parks, the landfills? How could any buildings be constructed if there were no state to issue building permits? Would we go back to living in caves? These questions and more are answered on the Anarchitecture Podcast podcast. Tim, who's an architect, and Joe, who's an engineer, are twin brothers. Between them, they have three decades of experience delivering local and international construction projects. And so they are talking about issues related to the built environment from the perspective of anarcho-capitalism. All the kinds of tricky questions you're not quite sure about, that's exactly what they do. And that's what they discuss over at Anarchitecture podcast.com. I'm going to link to it at tomwoods.com slash 788 as the listener website mentioned. I'm mentioning their website, of course, because they used my link when getting their hosting. So I give them a nice little boost here. I give them some SEO juice with a backlink on my site, plus two dozen free video tutorials and membership in my private bloggers group where we plot together and help each other. So if that appeals to you, check out tomwoods.com slash publicity before you get started, and you'll find out how to get all those goodies. All right, that's going to do it. Remember, this week is Thanksgiving week, and Black Friday's coming up. That is the biggest deal I have the whole year for Liberty Classroom, which is my flagship product where you can learn the history and economics. They didn't teach you. I teach it to you. Other people I trust teach it to you. Super duper great stuff. And... In particular, the master membership, which includes the 400 videos I made for the Ron Paul curriculum in Western civilization and in government, all kinds of great stuff is all packed in there, and this is the best deal you're going to get all year. So check that out on Black Friday, libertyclassroom.com. See you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.